brand trust is the number one factor customers give for shopping at their favorite retailers and buying brands, a recent survey said. Um, and a study in the Reputation Institute found that only 15.5% of UK customers believe the advertising that they see, which is slightly worrying, isn't it? Um, and 79% said that they are much, much more likely, if not at all likely, to give their information to companies and brands that they trust. So that's the main reason why we're going to be talking about that tonight. Um, I was reminded of that Billy Joel song, do you know, A Matter of Trust? And the line, constant battle for the ultimate state of control. Um, in that we see that the consumer now is in control, aren't they? In control more than ever before. And so that they get to choose whether they want to have a conversation with uh, brands and companies uh, and people that run companies and they will choose whether they want to trust that business or not. Um, I, I found this lovely fact today which was consumers now create as much information every two days as they did from the dawn of civilization to 2003. So this five letter word trust that's what we're going to talk about this evening um, and for those companies that generate trust how do they look after it and how do they cherish that kind of gold-plated word. Um, I met Benny a couple of years ago when we were doing the Tesco pitch. And, um, you know, for those of you, actually some of you were involved, um, there's that slight moment, isn't there, before we go into a pitch and we brief. We had three chief execs, two CMOs in the meeting. Um, and we briefed them and said, so what you need to do is kind of, you know, the agencies have worked really hard. It takes quite a long time. A lot of money has been invested both sides. So, you know, kind of be nice. Ask nice questions. You can be as challenging as you like, but you know, kind of smile a bit. Um, so we <laughs> we went through the first one, and it was pretty hard. It was a couple of uh, nearly three hours of pitch, and then he sat there and asked two or three questions. Didn't smile at all. So we went to the next one, and he did the same. And I said, Benny, you know, we can you, you can kind of be chatty. He said, No, it's really important that the agencies don't think I'm smiling at them because I like them. I want to hear everything that they say because the agency that we choose is going to make a difference to my business. And I need to create a new bank and Tesco's needs to develop what we're trying to do as a retail store. So it's really, really important that I listen to every word the agency said. Um, and actually I tell that story a lot of times because it's a it shows how important that kind of partnership um, and that trust between the agency is. And, and actually since then, Benny is one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met. Um, and you will see some of that this evening, I think. Um, so there's no pressure, Ben. Okay. Uh, you were saying that recently you've, you've done a piece of research on trust and identified two types of trust that the bank, but I think also retail, looks at. Um, one is transactional trust and the other is effective trust. And I just wonder if you talk a little bit about what, what that looks like for you and as you're trying to build a new bank, what that means. Um, I picked up an article um, probably a couple of years ago now, three years ago maybe, and it said somebody had blundered and the most expensive orgy in history was over. It ended when the utter confidence that was its essential prop received an enormous jolt and it didn't take long for the flimsy structure to settle earthward. And that could have been written, I guess, in The Economist or the Lex column. But it was actually an article written in 1931 by F. Scott Fitzgerald talking about the 1929 crash. And why do I mention that? Well, firstly, I think there's a tendency to think that as the world changes, and we do, the world changes all the time, and, you know, the influence of digital, for example, and big data, things that we may talk about tonight, are changing the environment that we're in as, as business people and how we look after our customers. But there's, there is an essential kind of constancy too. And some of the things that have happened in the last five or six or seven years are the very same things that happened before. Coming from, I'm in a curious position where I run a bank, but it's part of a very large retailing group. And one of the things that's happened clearly in the last um, five, six, seven years is the undermining of trust in banks in particular, but tr trust can get undermined in all sectors and indeed the horse meat saga of not so long ago was an example of it happening in another sector 
the other one that I'm associated with. But what we did is we went out and looked at what are the real components of trust. And we found that there are basically two ways in which customers judge their trust in an organisation. And one is the transactional trust. The simple question, do you get what you've been promised you would get in banking? You know, your ATM card works, your debits, direct debits get uh, t you know, taken off at the right time of the month, your savings are safe. Um, but it applies to every business. And then the other one is effective trust, which is, does this business really put my interests first? And it's interesting, banks score generally very highly on transactional trust, where there is a belief they will do what they said they would do, but they score very badly on effective trust, the notion that the bank would actually put the customer's interests first. And for us, as Tesco Bank, our curious sort of in it position at this stage is that we score not quite as well as the traditional high street banks on, a, on transactional trust, but we actually score much better on effective trust. I think it's probably a better place for the ball to lie for the moment because I think we can progress better from that position. But I think what's quite interesting too is that the effective trust is determined by the culture of an organisation, um, the culture of a sector even, and culture is itself determined by leadership. And if I would say that the failure of banks in the UK to earn effective trust is a failure of leadership. And for any organisation, whether it's a bank or any other, trying to uh, you know, develop that sense of effective trust is the glue that I think that binds customers and organisations together. Um, you know, and I think that any organisation has to be very vigilant about even when it does have a culture that transcends all other aspects of its business, if it gets it right, to keep it right is very important. And you know, one of the things I increasingly businesses have to be very careful about is the kind of hypnotic influence that success can have on nourishing senior executives. I think it's really very important to make sure that you don't allow that to, to take your eye off the ball, because so many businesses stop recognising why they've succeeded, stop recognising where there is jeopardy. And, and, can, and can actually make sure they get themselves back in the right place. So I think the notion of splitting trust into these two is quite a powerful um, kind of architecture of, kind of analysis. And do you think that, uh, and do, does the retail side of the business look at it in the same way? Are, are there some similarities? I, th I think it's true for every single business. And I do actually think, I mean, Horsemeat was a fantastic example of, I mean, I, I used to go to meetings at, at, in government with Treasury and say, you know, the big difference between the business that I am part of versus the business that I am running is that you know what you get when you walk into a supermarket. I stopped saying that after horse meat <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because yeah. you know it wasn't quite straightforward, a, a kind of analogous kind of conversation. So it does apply to every business. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I, I always remember talking to Terry Leahy, um, who I think is probably the most extraordinary executive I've worked with. And I said to him, what do you think made Tesco at its best when it was at its best? And he said, it's when we were prepared to put the customer before the P&L in the short run. And so it was taking confection away from the checkouts, it was introducing 24-hour <laughs> stores, it was introducing club card points, mm. when that would you know, take away 25% of the margin, but it was right for the customer. Yeah. And if it's right for the customer, the customer will come back. Yeah. What impact did Horsemeat have on McDonald's? Uh, it was a really interesting time for the industry as a whole, really. Um, yeah, what we saw was, uh, for us, I guess it was a time when we started to see some payback for um, the work we'd done to grow trust in our own brand. Um, you know, the, the, the sector as a whole had the spotlight shone on it almost immediately. And um, you know, the, the customers started um, allocating blame and responsibility immediately before the, the depth of any stories were told out. And, and in reality, um, uh, yeah, there were very few businesses, um, fortunately ours was one of them, which were com completely clean through that, uh, that, that horse meat scandal. And uh, when we talked to customers about it, more of them believed us than not. And, and, and I think for me, that's kind of what, what actually trust really is. You spend a lot of time talking about what, what is trust? What does it really mean? And uh, I think the reality is when, when your trust, tr customers trust you, then uh, they want to believe what you tell them. And they want to believe, more than that, they want to believe the good things they hear about you. Mm -hmm. And when they don't trust you, they want to believe the bad things. And actually, whether it's good or bad underneath, mm -hmm. it almost becomes irrelevant to them because th they have a, a natural feeling one way or the other. So we still had to be very clear that we weren't affected by the horse meat scandal, but they believed us when we told them. Mm. Um, many of our competitors 
were un unable to, to be so um, clear about it. And certainly they felt the impact much stronger than us. Still a very difficult time for a business to grow trust who was involved in the food industry because the whole food industry took such a battery. Mm -hmm. But certainly we, we didn't see the negative impact that, that many of our uh, competitors did. I first met Alistair, do you remember saying seven years ago? Absolutely, yeah. Which, uh, and actually, if you look at you know, the economy and also McDonald's in particular, seven years ago, the business was really quite different. And uh, we've been doing some work on agencies and, and you know, kind of capability. And then Alistair said, actually, what we really want to do is work with our agency partners on making sure that as a family, you were very specific about this, that we don't squabble amongst ourselves, that we treat each other with respect and um, that we kind of air a lot of the issues that we've got. And so we created Optimize that was the way of working between McDonald's and their agencies. Um, and, and part of that was around how you, know, you could keep the same sort of um, numbers of people at McDonald's and change the sort of people that were working there um, increase your marketing budgets, but actually keep some of the structure the same. Um, and for me, something that I've seen over those seven years is that the trust pillar within the organisation is, is really critical. It's something you talk about an awful lot. Do you, do you look at it in the same sort of way that um, Benny does at, uh, as at, at Tesco's? Uh, you, you know, you're obviously right that it's, it's fundamental to our business. And uh, you know, if you look at what's driven our business change over the last seven years, the fact there's twice as many people trust McDonald's now than did seven years ago, you know, it, it, that sits beneath everything. Um, the short answer to the question is, no, I don't look at exactly the same as, as Benny does, but I recognise an awful lot of, of what he's talking about in there, um, you know, particularly the culture that sits behind being a trusted organisation, you know, the fact that to be trusted, actually, it's all about the way you behave um, and being transparent and letting people see the way you behave. It's no good being transparent if the behaviour that sits behind it's not right in the first place. And you only get that behaviour uh, right if it comes from the leadership and every single person in the, in the business believe in doing business in a certain way. And that extends to the way we work with our agencies as much as it does the way that we um, source our food and the way we serve it to our customers. But when Benny talks about um, two different types of trust, uh, effectual and transactional, uh, for, for us, those are wrapped up in, in, in the same thing. Um, I guess the effectual trust is probably the one that we measure as a business. You know, that, that is yeah, people's propensity to feel good about us, to believe us, people's propensity to, to want to hear the good things. But for me, um, the transactional piece is the moment of truth, the bit that either confirms that you're a good business or you're a bad business. And actually, um, it doesn't matter how good the things are that we've done up to that point, if we let them down at that point at the front counter, then everything's forgotten. Um, the challenge is, if the effectual trust isn't right, it doesn't matter what you do at the front counter, you can't turn around um, the perceptions that have started there. But um, for me, it's the easiest point in the, in the um, whole process to lose it is when you hand over, for us, when we hand over a Big Mac at the counter. We can tell them that it's 100% British beef. We can, we can tell them that we know exactly what farm it came from. We can tell them the lettuce is from a farm somewhere in Kent. Um, we, we can tell them that the person who's serving them is, is, is fair paid, uh, is being trained to, to get a degree yeah. from working at McDonald's. But if what actually happens is that Big Mac is all messed about, it falls out of the box, um, and actually their fries are cold when they're handed over, you know, most of the other stuff disappears into the background. And when we're serving three and a half million people a day through our restaurant, that, that for us is a huge, huge challenge, making sure that we reinforce everything else that we do uh, when the customer has their own personal experience. Thank you. Um, and we'll come and back and talk about the impact of social media in a bit, because I think uh, the impact that that has on, on everyone's brand, but, but that kind of experience um, makes it even worse, doesn't it? So we'll come back and talk about that. Yeah, in a bit. absolutely. <laughs> Johnny, um, even longer than seven years ago, uh, I was at Haystack and I had a brief for, it was my very first advertising brief for the AA, and I knew that about three months after that, I'd have the pitch to do British Gas. And so I had um, phoned a few chief execs and nobody would see me in the industry because I was so new, I didn't really know anyone, apart from Nick Hurrell, actually, who I think is here this evening, so I always have to say thank you to Nick. Um, so I phoned my friend Gay Haynes and said, nobody's going to speak to me and I've got a £20 million brief in a minute um, and I don't actually know enough about the agencies. And she said, don't worry, Johnny's just started an agency. He hasn't got any clients, he'll be able to see you. <laughs> 
So the afternoon... <laughs> Not because I'm a nice guy, just because <laughs> I didn't have any clients. So in the afternoon, I went to see Johnny, and we had a cup of coffee, and he said, don't worry, I can introduce you to everyone in the industry. But actually, we can definitely help the AA. Um, I said, yeah, Johnny, you've got like seven people. He said, oh, it'll be fine, don't worry. So um, actually, you were a little bit small for the AA, but about six months later, British Gas um, came along and we did the pitch. And we're all sitting here somewhere. Um, and, uh, and you won the pitch. And a long time later, 15 years or so, you've still got that business. And I think one of the things that we all know about Johnny and, and his agency is that you are unbelievably good at keeping, it, keeping clients um, building that trust in clients. But how do you, as an agency, help clients through communications and marketing develop that kind of trust and communications? And you said that the stat earlier on, 15% of customers don't believe anything that advertising says. What do, you, what do you do to overcome that? <coughs> well, it's funny. I, um, when I first started in this business years ago, in fact, I'm looking at Adam Lee, when we started together as graduate trainees at Ogilvy, I remember uh, Ogilvy priding itself on the brand, the trust it helped brands build, and the benchmark for trust then for brands was to try and reach the sorts of levels that major institutions had. So used to say, look, we've done such a great job with Kellogg's or Marmite or whatever that it's almost as trusted as the church, the police, politicians, you know, the <laughs> banks, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, and all those institutions that hold. And, and that literally would be, we've done such a brilliant job with you guys. <coughs> and clients used to come to us and say. How can you help us build that level of trust? And I remember the first client I worked on was a financial services uh, brand called Eagle Star. And I remember the ingredients of trust used to be, you know, um, be on television. And this was, you could statistically prove this. If you're on television in financial services in 1985, in centre break news at 10, people thought, oh, well, they probably won't, you know, and you do your research, mm -hmm. they're probably not going to go bust because, you know, they're on, they're, they're on the news at 10. And if you had any country name or royal or any other combination of those things, you had quite a level of trust straight away. If you're the royal Canada something of what's it, you're at certain levels of trust. Mm -hmm. And most clients then were just about, okay, how can you continue to build this level of trust? And we used to have a whole number of, you know, obvious ingredients to do that. Have Anthony Hopkins do your <laughs> voiceover, you know, then Mrs. Miggins will go, oh, he's in the news at 10, and they've got Anthony Hopkins, and they've got royal in their name. You know, and, and they must be fine. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, but they the, the, the prove that out. And then, of course, all these institutions that everyone used to peg brands against to say, could they ever be as, as trusted as us, let everybody down. You know, it turns out that, you know, the journalists were taking bungs from the police who you thought were supposed to be there to stop them doing it, from the politicians who were all fiddling their expenses, and from the bankers who were all you know, on the make, and all of that wasn't, you know, it was heightened by the media, but all of it turned out pretty much to be the case, you know, to the point you made earlier about executives who got carried away with themselves and et cetera, et cetera, that, that's what had happened to the world, so, so trust was, was, was destroyed. And funnily enough, I don't know how often you get it, Suki, but the number of pitches since 2009, where the brief is some variation of, I'm sure everyone is in agency land, of the, how do we help, how can you help us, you know, rebuild, Trust and you know some people jump into it all well now because of social media you can have a lot more conversations with your customers and you can get them to get involved in lots more things. I don't really think that's the answer, the fundamental answer. The fundamental answer, and I think it's partly in what you know Benny and, and, and uh, you know all good brands are, are thinking about, which is behave in a trustworthy manner is the first thing. So an ad agency or no kind of agency is going to help you rebuild rebuild trust. You're going to have to start by doing the things that earned you the trust in the first place. So be incredibly dependable. Do what you say you're going to do. Make it perfectly clear that you're transparent and you're not on the make, either as a group of executives or an organization. Um, live in a world now where there is radical transparency so that assume that at some point somebody's going to find out if you're, if you're not doing that. Those feel to me like the basics. Then beyond that, if you really want to start building trust, I think you then have to say, it's not what you say e.g. we're called Royal Canada and I've got Anthony Hopkins, that makes a difference anymore, it's what you do. And I think where <coughs> good agencies can be good partners to marketing departments is to say, given what we want this brand to stand for, what are the things that we can genuinely do and genuinely deliver? Mm. Take the chocolate away from the counter because we know that mum's, you know, no, I understand that pushing a shopping trolley around a supermarket on a wet Wednesday afternoon is miserable and if you've got a baby, let's let you park next to the beginning. Fundamental things that we can do 
that would make people trust us, and also, I think, hugely, trust consumers. I think brands that trust their consumers, you know, suddenly you think, oh, hold on, they haven't gone and said, well, I said I had an accident. Uh, and they haven't gone and tried to prove that I didn't have an accident or that I was lying. <laughs> They've said, okay, you've had an accident, how can we help, rather than, or look at, you know, and I think, so, brands that trust their consumers, that trust them back, and then do things that are generous to consumers, I think. And then I think the role of advertising or marketing, whatever, is probably to point at those things. But I think you have to do genuine things in the way you do your pricing, your behavior with customers, your T's and C's and et cetera, fundamental things, which I think good agency folks are good at working with clients at. Change your organization so you deserve to be trusted. So don't crave trust through communications, earn it through behavior. And then I think our role's to, to point at it, which is very different to the yeah. world I entered 20 years ago. Yeah. I think one of the things we'll come, another thing we'll talk about in a minute is what you've done as businesses that cost you money to do, that, that, uh, that don't have a direct return. So I'll let mm -hmm. you think about that and then um, I will talk to Steve first. Um, many of you, I get, got to know Steve when he was running TAG. Um, and then four years ago, yeah, took over as chairman of Crystal Palace Football Club. And for those of you that know me well, know that I am obsessed with sport, but know absolutely nothing about football. Mm -hmm. So um, when, I, I, I can't believe I keep telling the story, but when, I, when Crystal Palace went into the premiership, I texted Steve and went, oh, Steve, great, that's good news. You must be really pleased. And he wrote back a nanosecond later and went, yeah, it's great. Fine, good. I feel quite pleased myself, noticed something, good sympathy with my friend. And then uh, it was about, I don't know, a few weeks later and we were at something together. And uh, there were all these people coming up to you going, oh, it's amazing, Steve, it's amazing, just uh, made my day, absolutely amazing. And you, and you turned to somebody and said, yeah, it was basically the third best day of my life after the two, my two children being born. You have to say that, don't you? <laughs> 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 and then I didn't realise that, yeah, that actually my understated message wasn't entirely appropriate. We all know it's There we are. But I was talking to Roy Hodgson the other day, who said to me that as a chairman, you are absolutely the one to watch and that you're going to be an extraordinary chairman in years to come. So he has great faith in you. And, you know, you can see from what you've done, some of the brilliance that you brought to TAG, you've maybe bringing into your football club as well. Um, I mean, I thought that kind of the ultimate trust is between footballers and their club, isn't it? You know, that kind of absolute obsessional love for everything that they do and the cheering and just... But, but we were talking about this and you could see over the last year that actually the fans that you had before a year ago that loved Crystal Palace for everything that they did and trusted you maybe the new fans coming in and maybe, you know, what was it you said? So that the money that Crystal Palace had 18 months ago was how much? We would turn over about 14 million. In and a, how in much do you turn over now? About 100. So you've gone from a business of 14 million to 100 million in about a year. Yeah. What does that do to the kind of trust you have with your fans? Um, well, I think, firstly, trust in football is really stripped bare when you're an owner. So, that, that I mean, I think the first position of most football fans about the owners of their club is that they don't trust them. I think that's, that's the going in point. Um, <clears throat> you, anybody that runs a business, if you think about it, are just a custodian of that business, but never more so than a football club. You know, they're, they're institutions that your customers, for want of a better word, you can't ever call them that in, in a fans forum, but here I call them that, have a real sense of ownership over. You know, they believe they own <coughs> not just the product that they, they consume from it, but the essence of the brand, um, probably, you know, more than, than, than any other business. So it's, it's, it's a struggle because often it, it means quite different things to different people. And as you try and grow the brand, as you say, you've got a, a group of people that are imbued in the brand for many, many years and sort of trapped in some ways in the heritage. And then you've got a whole new audience. In fact, there was a... There was a piece today about how clubs in, in the UK particularly, w w we get it, because we do have the biggest league in the world. The Premier League is, is the biggest sporting league of any kind in the world. And, you know, it's how you hold on to that heritage and that authenticity and that trust and appeal at the same time to a global audience where they perhaps want different things. So you look at someone like 
Vincent Tan at Cardiff, who's decided that actually what you know the world needs is a, a football team that plays in red. Another one, <laughs> when most of the fans think that they're quite sort of miffed about that because they've played in blue for the last last hundred years. So um, it's you know it's a, it's a very very delicate thing, and 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 all of the things that Johnny said were absolutely spot on, and never more so in football. I mean, we live in a world of, of, of you know increased cynicism. If you go back to those days that, that Johnny was talking about, where you could sell those very basic things, we're on after ten o'clock. we you know we've got Royal in our name. It just won't wash anymore, and I'm, I know you'll come on to talk about social media. Social media is very active in, in football. And for me, I think the word is authenticity. You know, that's, that's what the, the whole thing is about. You know, you really have to start at the product and, and, and what you are and work backwards from there. And if you, if you intend to change anything, I think you have to be very, very sure that it is innately what you are and what you believe in, because you can't act it for very long in this world. If you try and act it and pretend it, you'll get caught out because you won't be authentic to, to, to what you really are. So, um, you know, I'm fortunate in that, you know, that, that <laughs> it seems quite logical to me. It seems quite logical to only try and tell people that you are what you really are and what you're going to do. And that, and that works very well in football. But I think it, for some brands, sometimes it's an education. And, and for some other football owners, it's, it seems difficult and to do. And is it different from being an owner of a football club to when you were owning tag. Do, do people have a different relationship with you as the person who, who owns it as a, rather than the chief exec? Well, it's actually, I mean, it's, there are extraordinary differences. I mean, when I tag, you know, I like to think was probably the most successful thing I've ever done. You know, we, we, I started as a very small business, ended up with probably, including part-time people, 3,000 part-time, full-time people, 13 offices in the world, a couple of hundred million of turnover starting from nothing, you know, I was, I was quite proud of it, yet nobody was particularly impressed by it at all, really. I never, <laughs> used, to, I never, I never used to get asked to do anything like this when I played the tag. I, mean, I was remotely interested in what I had to say. It wasn't until I bought a loss-making business in South London that <laughs> suddenly everybody wanted me to go to their school and talk to them about how to be, you know, how, how you made it, that. you know. So, um, I, I think, I think the, the biggest difference um, in, in terms of running a business, is, is, is it's so public. You know, that everybody knows that column inches now are, are just because of the immediacy of live events. I mean, all, all these guys get it. Tesco's have had their share of it, and Johnny, with the, with, personally, with the brands that he works on. Obviously, the, the, the media scrutiny on everybody is, is, is high, and we do everything with that light shone on us. But in football, it is, it is daily, you know, and it can be quite abusive as well. And, and trying to make the right decision in that maelstrom is, is quite hard sometimes. Yeah. And, and it's quite personal sometimes, isn't it? Do, do you, as running a bank, there's a piece of research here by Brand Fogg that said that, the ev that they saw in this research that the ever-growing need for C-suite um, execs to be on social media and to respond, respond personally. And as a chief exec, you know, do you find that the pressure on you personally is very different from the business and are you inextricably linked in the same sort of way? Yeah, I mean, it's very different. I mean, I've, I'm a, I've been a lifelong football fan, a Celtic fan, and I have to say, you know, football is an extraordinary sport, but it's also an extraordinary business in terms of the disproportionate amount of spotlight it gets. I don't think there's any comparison with regular businesses, although, interestingly enough, I think banks have had it's become much more personal running a bank because banks have become kind of just you know bad pe bad bad organizations run by bad people mm. um, but I, I mean t two things I would say when I mean, one is first of all I think you've got to be careful I, I, I go back to Steve's point about authenticity I think it is massively important and what comes with authenticity is frailties too because you know <coughs> nobody's perfect and actually you've got t I mean Oscar Wilde had a great expression which was be yourself because everybody else is taken and it's actually <laughs> quite, a, you know, it's quite true. Um, and I, I, th I think I, I'm not a great fan of pretending I'm doing stuff that I'm not doing. So when I write a blog, I write the blog. I don't get people to tweet for me. I don't get people to write blogs for me. When I do it, I do it. And when I don't do it, I don't do it. And I think it's, I, I just think, I think often, the more, as, as I've gone through my career, 
I think the most important characteristic of leadership is authenticity. And it's not to say that you can just be whoever you like, whenever you like, and you don't have to set yourself high standards. But be yourself, it's your best chance. How important, that authenticity piece, we talked a bit about culture and authenticity. How important is that for McDonald's and your role within McDonald's that you're doing? Uh, it's critical. I, I mean, well, when, when I think about it, yeah, how can you ask somebody to trust you if you're not the person they think you are? And whether that, you know, whether, whether that person be a brand as a whole or whether it be you as an individual. Um, so, yeah, you have to make sure that absolutely everything you do is, is genuine uh, because people will see through it and it you know, only needs one person to see through it and the whole world will know that, it, that, it's, that it's not true. Um, you know, I think it's always true that you know, we all have a responsibility to the thousands of people who, who work in organisations that, that we have to behave in a way that is, that is appropriate, responsible uh, and authentic. Um, you know, it, it, is more, it is more transparent now than it's ever been whether, whether people want it to be or not because of uh, the, the, the social uh, media phenomenon. But the, the reality is that um, you know, we are there to do a, a, a role for our business a role for the people who work within our business, and um, ultimately a role for our customers. And if that is based on something that's not genuine, mm. it will be seen through quicker today than ever been before. And what and do you do when, quick. so McDonald's has a bad day and something bad happens, and then it's all, so the instance in the States when there was a whole big furor on social media, what do, you do, what do you do then? First thing we always do is to, to kind of sit back and take it in, and just to make sure we understand exactly what's happened. Um, I think the, um, the reality, again, is uh, if you, you can make mistakes very, very quickly, far quicker than you ever could before with, with, with huge impact. And that, that can be um, as important in your response as it is in, in whatever went wrong to, to start with. So our, you know, our, first, uh, our first point will, will always be to understand as much as we possibly can. And let's, un and let's understand what we, what we should have done, what we shouldn't have done. Uh, and then just make sure that we're, we're very clear. Do, do we need to fix something? Um, is this a genuine story in its first right? In, in, in the first case, I mean, you know, half the time it will be uh, created stories that, that, that have no founding that, that, that will end up creating a, a reputation challenge for the business. And, and clearly, you need to make sure that we respond in an appropriate way, at an appropriate pace, with uh, appropriate transparency. Mm. Uh, and always for us, it's always about letting people see for themselves. You know, we've certainly learned in the UK several years ago that you know, it, it's no good keep giving people facts. You've got to give people access to facts to find out for themselves and, and tell them the story in the right way. So that, that will always be, be part of our response. And you know, if we have got something wrong, then we know we have to come very clean very quickly and say yeah. that, that was a mistake. And, yeah. Uh, and this is how we're going to address it. And what happens in, in somewhere like Tesco where actually it's really hard? So do, it, it, I, I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine the kind of board meetings can be quite tough at the moment. And then if you've got a whole kind of social media aspect to it, does it increase the pressure? Can you act? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I think, oddly enough, in a crisis, leadership really gets tested. And whether it's just a period of, of, of pain or it's a particular specific crisis. I mean, in the bank, we had a, a week three years ago where basically the web went down and the phones were overrun and because we're a basically a digital bank, customers couldn't get in touch with us. It was the kind of digital equivalent of having a high street branch network with clothes above it and it causes panic because people care about money, they care about their wealth, they care about being able to pay things and get the money back and it was a real crisis and I have to say, I think in those times composure for leadership is just the most important thing. Um, there's a little known and rather curious book by Edgar Allan Poe called The Descent Into the Maelstrom where there's a sailor who is basically caught in this nautical vortex and the only way in which he gets himself free is to just have rational detachment from what's going on around him. And I do actually, I always remember when I read that, I think <coughs> that in a crisis leadership really has to put its best foot forward and rational detachment is what people need, mm. no matter what it is. <coughs> and do you tweet? I don't, no, no. Do you tweet? Far too dangerous. No, no. <laughs> Do you tweet? A bit. I, I tell you the interesting thing, though, about the rational detachment, I think also so social media, I think, is very dangerous for some mm. leaders mm. because it is a way of suddenly thinking, let's go and yeah. this has all gone horribly wrong, let's go. Yeah. And I think, you know, we often get asked, and I remember Will and I have had these conversations with previous 
chief executive. In fact, it's not a great part of our creds that there's quite a number of organisations we work with that have had <laughs> challenges to trust with British Gas, RBS, or, or Talk Talk. We've been through some pretty major yeah. crises, and 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 we've not done any, both we and the people who have not always handled it brilliantly. But we we tried to learn from it, and I think one of the dangers of social media is somebody wants to immediately overfix the problem. Mm -hmm. Straight away, you know, and the truth of the of, of the first crisis with Talk Talk is the product doesn't work, <laughs> which is why the people are pissed off and why yeah. that you know. Yeah. So you've got to yeah. fix the problem. Da, da, da. And the danger is that a, the CEO surrounded by some PR people yeah. wants to get their hands on some kind of mechanism that allows them to go and say, you know, and and, and had these conversations with, with CEOs before. Is if you don't tweet and it's not something you want to do all the time, don't do it just for this yeah. crisis because there's an expectation that people that tweet. Yeah. Do it all do the it, time. Yeah. I mean, Steve, you, Steve, Steve will you, be in you a lot tweet of pain a lot, by you? not tweeting for the last 40 minutes. Yeah, no you've done very well now. leaving your phone alone. Yeah, it's good with me, isn't it? Um, why do you tweet? When I first um, got involved with the football club, first bought the football club, they, they actually have um, quite advanced forums um, in terms of numbers of people. So they've been doing it for years, most football fans. and. For those people that support football clubs will know that we're quite anoraki, you know, the Crystal Palace fans are known as sort of the nerdy people of South London. So <coughs> there were two quite well-formed forums where, where the fans go on and they talk about the club. Um, so it was, a, it was a, Twitter is just an extension of, of that, you, you know, you can rather than go and post on each one, you can get to more people more quickly. And people's hunger for knowledge and insight, you know, I, I decided, I didn't understand <coughs> why it was all a black box. I didn't understand why the fans couldn't be told more about what was going on. I didn't understand why it all had to have this deep mystery and, and, and you couldn't explain to, you know, the customers why you did things. So, and it comes back to what we were talking about before, uh, you know, the authenticity. When you talk about trust, fine, you know, you, you, you do the things that you say you're going to do. But I think it's more than that. And I, and I think, again, it's stripped bare in a football club. People want to know that you as a brand adhere to the principles. They want to trust you to make the right decisions mm. when the decisions come along. And, and that they want to trust that the person that you're portraying to them is authentic and that behind that you will think in the way that you said that you'll, you'll, you'll think. And it's an ongoing organic thing that you've got with your customer base. I remember, and I may have this wrong, but I remember, for example, it brought to mind when McDonald's started selling salads. You know, and I in the end, that time. I remember that time. And in the end, you know, the customer said, "Well, actually, you know, that's not very authentic. We don't really want yeah. you. So, you know, if we want a salad, we'll go to a salad shop. We come to McDonald's because we want a burger. You know, and we're perfectly capable of policing ourselves. Thanks very much. In terms of of what we eat, and I think that's th that, that, that's the essence of it for me. And I don't think, I mean, the people at the club when I went on the first football forum were just literally horrified. You know, you you can't talk to the fans. You know, it will be." Horrendous. Um, and of course it is. I mean, if you're not capable of balancing the views that you get, I mean, you will not have a broader demographic of customer base than a football club. You know, you've, you've, you've got, you know, chief execs of huge global businesses. I had this surreal experience the other day where somebody crashed into my car and the police were there and Eddie Izzard <laughs> rang me while I was at midnight in the middle of the road trying to deal with my car. I've got Eddie Izzard, slightly <laughs> drunk from LA, telling me what a good job I'd done against Liverpool. All right, Eddie, but I've just got the police. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the nice lady policeman and tell him you're Eddie Izzard. Um, so, <laughs> you know, you, you, I think that communicating with the fans is so important. Communicating with all your customers is important. But of course, you have to balance the views that you get, and that, as Benny yeah. said, you know, you have to lead and, and balance all those inputs. But, so, Benny, do you think that do you think you should tweet? Is there another way that you communicate? I know you do your blog, because to me, it feels yeah. like that. That's such a big. You, you hear no, people I, saying, I mean, if, I, "If I can have a conversation where I can yeah. openly ask yeah, the I questions sure. I want to ask." You know, I, I, I don't know who, which I don't know if it was Johnny or, or Steve said, "If you're going to tweet, don't just tweet." No, you know, you either do it or you don't mm. do it. Yeah, and unfortunately. A lot of chief executives who tweet, it's the most boring shit you've ever heard in your mm. life, you know? <laughs> and they just, they, they don't really have enough mm. kind of stuff to put in it. And, and so it's, it's, it's kind of trendy. And then, it's, I mean, I, I think the football thing is completely different. I think you're doing absolutely the right thing, because I think it's, an, it's, it's, it's the nature of your relationship with those football fans is different from my relationship to Tesco Bank customers. And actually, I should be careful to just remind myself that they don't really care that much about me. <laughs> and actually the most important thing I can do is run this business with the right culture to deliver the right results for them. 
and tweeting would be a distraction. And you know, I'd, I'd send some terrible tweets late at night as well. I mean. <laughs> <laughs>